you know, I think a lot of people are going to have cabin fever, you know, like you're going to get a little insane, you know, because going to an office for a lot of people is, it separates home life and work life. How can we not get stuck with this cabin fever going insane in our home? I'm really trying to just practice gratitude in a sense that actually focusing on what I do have rather than what I don't have now. And I know that can be very difficult. I just don't want people to think I'm saying that as a blanket statement. I know that's going to vary from person to person, but I'd also recommend people um, look to some wonderful work and a book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Some people will have heard of in, in terms of the examined life. I, I think it's one of the key readings, Matt. Mm. And um, some of you may know that he was in a concentration camp in the Second World War and um, they basically took everything from him. And uh, he said that the only thing he had left was, I guess, his in, internal mindset. And uh, that's what really got him through. And I, I know I used to say to some of my clients when they were going through hard times, um, uh, I guess at the very least, you're not in a concentration camp right now. Like, I know it might feel like that right now with the cabin fever, um, but it's, it's, things could be worse, I guess. It's interesting to see what happens when things are taken away from you. They wrench from you, like job, your plans. It's a very inconvenient thing to be stripped away from the infrastructure. Um, so what if meaning is one of those parts of the, uh, the positive psychology model that is really utilised right now? It, again, it's going to vary from person to person in how they make meaning out of this right now. A lot of people do get meaning out of their work. And, you know, when their job is taken from them, it sort of strips that sense of identity of something that they do that's important. Um, and that can be really hard to come to terms with. And again, I don't want to underestimate that. But I think, you know, as best as we can, and the research shows that experiencing some positivity, finding little thin slices of joy, um, they're often referred to, that those experience of positivity can actually help you to be more creative and more solution focused. Because let's say, for example, you have lost your job, you know, the, your money um, is dwindling, the, the food stocks are dwindling. Um, it's so easy to start to spiral down. And the positivity, just even just tiny little bits of just focusing on some good times with your family or, you know, a chat to a friend on the phone can help you spiral up a little bit and see some options and, and some solutions. So again, in terms of us being able to find solutions for ourselves, for our community and for our planet, we need the positivity to be able to be creative enough to find solutions. When you say the word positivity, I guess I'd love to, I love our audience to hear what your definition is of positivity. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I guess, you know, typically people would associate positivity with just being positive, you know, just be positive or just think positive. And for me, that I couldn't be further from the truth. So particularly my background, Matt, as a clinical psychologist, which is I, I was doing and working with people that were going through horrendous traumas in the early work that I did, um, you know, to be able to learn, um, I would be able to, you know, uh, be able to sit with some of those difficult emotions. So for me, positivity encompasses the capacity to be able to sit with difficult emotions and find some strategies on, on what to do with those. Um, and, but also it encompasses sim this simultaneous, a cultivation of positive emotions like joy and uh, elevation, which is an, a, an emotion. It's a positive moral emotion when we observe people doing good acts. So it's done, they call it the Mother Teresa effect, if you like, when people observe Mother Teresa doing some great work. There's actually scientific research to show that you get this uh, physiological goosebumps. And, and, you know, even now I know if I'm seeing some good news that there's snippets of it on the television at the moment, people doing some incredible acts out there. Uh, the research has shown that you actually feel this physiological goosebumps and there's this urge, this sort of internal urge to want and go, to want and go and do something similar to that. So we're sort of elevated by observing other good acts. So again, I'm really encouraging. I know, uh, you know, the news has been tiny little snippets of good news on the news, but we need more good news. Mm. So positivity for me encompasses thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So again, in terms of our mindsets, it's not just thinking positive, which can often be for some people actually unrealistic, you know, it's actually thinking more hopefully. So um, believing that there are options and pathways around the challenges that we have. Um, the emotions, so as I mentioned, elevation, joy, gratitude, another positive uh, emotion, and then behaviors. 
So behaviours like ha- giving somebody a hand or practising gratitude, um, you know, there's a range of these positive behaviours that we can engage in. So it's the full range of uh, emotions, thoughts and behaviours that make up positivity for me. Yeah, it sounds like that people would really benefit from a model or a structure to follow. Like, yeah. Because people, as children, you reference off your parents and you reference off the maturest person around you or the most confident when you're, especially in times like these. And so you kind of, I feel like when I'm in doubt, I'm trying to reach out for something that I can plug into my life. Is there something yeah. that we could give our, our listeners who are going through some stress and they've, they're completely unstructured right now because they're working at home now and, and that's, that's, there's a lot of distractions at home and, uh, is, is there a structure that you suggest or some some tips that you could give us to help us structure in positivity or some time out? Yeah, look, there are a number of frameworks that exist out there. You've already mentioned one, PERMA, which is actually a really powerful model based on science um, that has been, I guess, shown to describe what we call somebody that's flourishing. So someone that's flourishing is experiencing high levels of positive emotions, uh, low levels of uh, mental illness, so high levels of psychological well-being, low levels of mental illness. And PERMA stands for positive emotions, which we started to speak about. And that goes beyond just being happy. Um, so I mentioned some of the positive emotions before. Then there's engagement. So so I guess firstly, in terms of our current situation, doing what you can to bring a little bit of joy, it would be my first, um, I guess, strategy. The E of, of PERMA is engagement. So that's finding activities that put us in the flow state. Um, again, some of your listeners might have come across that by Professor Mihal Yi, Chick Sent Me High, very tricky name to pronounce. <laughs> and um, for, those, for those at home that are, you know, with family, lucky enough to be around family, I know there are a lot of people doing board games. And in fact, I heard board games are selling out very quickly at the moment. And um, so we know that being completely absorbed in an activity, so a board game is a great example of it, um, particularly because some of the other flow activities like exercise, surfing, gardening, we might not be able to do right now. But board games allow us to completely engage in the moment. So when you're completely in the moment, you're not thinking about, you know, what just happened something awful that you might have seen on the news and you're not worrying about, which a lot of people are right now, what will happen. So any activities you can do to get in this flow state and be engaged. Also, it's an opportunity to think about your strengths and um, we might perhaps we might talk about that as a, a slightly you know, separate topic, um, character strength. So I think it's a great opportunity to think about that. The R are positive relationships. Um, if you, again, if you're at home lucky enough to be with family and friends, being able to try and Savor, so that means bring your sort of mindful attention with a sense of gratitude to the opportunity to perhaps spend a little bit more time. Although I know I'm hearing some people say perhaps it's going to be a little bit too much time with family at home at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the M of PERMA is meaning. Um, That can really come back to uh, a sense of our values. So I guess when you've got a lot of, um, you know, time at home, it does give you a potential opportunity to really think about what matters most. And I guess I'd argue, Matt, as I think you, um, you know, have spoken about and would agree with, most people are so busy in the lives that we led up until this pause that's being forced on us right now that they haven't stopped to take stock of what really is important in their lives. And we've been trying to encourage people to do that in our work proactively. But I think I would say right now there's a beautiful opportunity with perhaps a little bit of extra time you may have to reflect on um, and often it's not until the things are taken away from you that you start to get really clear on what does matter and then the a the final uh, a in perma is a sense of accomplishment so perhaps there's some activities some tasks some chores at home that have been sitting there unfinished you know for months or years Anything you can do to get a hit of competence on your daily basis right now, a sense of completion, we have decades of research to show that that will give you a positive hit to your well-being as well. We kind of take for granted how important structure is, you know, like yeah. our, our habits and, you know, we get up a certain time, we know we're going to go to our local cafe, we're going to drive here, we're going to catch the train and that's just completely just changed. So people, I know, inboxing me or like I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people on socials just sharing that change and that shift. And a lot of, it creates a lot of stress and anxiety. And, and I know that you've got some things to say about how stress and anxiety are 
they're really bad for you physically as well. Yeah. You've got to be really careful with that. What's some, what's some stressful, like what's some, what's some things you could give people who are going through a lot of stress right now as, as some techniques or some tools or resources or something that you'd like to encourage them with? I do want to say though, there are individual differences you know, between people as to how comfortable you sit with certainty and uncertainty structure and a lack of structure. Mm. Um, so I think firstly reflect, are you someone that needs structure or are you someone that sits a bit more comfortably? I know I have a friend that he says he's a pan, he, he's not a planner, he's a panner. So he likes to let the day pan out. And um, whereas I know for myself, I'm a planner. So one of the first things I did since we've moved uh, to, work, to work remotely from home is to draw up a structure for my day. Now, there is some variation depending on my appointments in my iCal, but I've got, you know, starting from 5, 5.30 in the morning during the weekdays, which is pretty much my start anyway. Um, you know, the first thing would be a mindfulness meditation exercise. Uh, which right now I would be encouraging people to do some form of that. Now, there are various forms of meditation. Prayer is a form of meditation. So it's finding something that works for you that allows your mind to settle, allows your physiology to settle and to calm down. And using your breath is a really powerful way um, that kicks in the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mentioned the structure. For me, that incorporates some form of meditation. Ideally, right now, I would be upping the ante on any stress management or well-being strategy that you already have in your routine. So for me, normally I meditate once a day. Right now, it's morning and night time. I'm book book ending my days so that I can also at the end of the day relax. And we know that relaxation precedes sleep. So there are a lot of people having issues with sleep right now. One of the most important things you can do is to find a way to physically relax before you go to sleep as well. So set up the structure, um, ensure there's slices of joy. So I know for some people they're busier than ever in um, transferring a lot of their work online, which is what we're doing. I'm actually busier than ever right now. So mm. I'm trying to have a morning tea break, a lunch break, an afternoon tea break with um, doing something that's gonna bring a little bit of joy and upliftment until I come back to being in that focused mode. We'll just tell everyone like your new book just came out recently, right? And uh, yes. it's, it's an awesome book. Everyone needs to buy it now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and it couldn't come at a more timely time actually now. Um, and I think there's some really relevant parts to the book that people would really benefit from right now. Like yeah. So Matt, the book, uh, as you know, uh, covers off, I've got my own model, um, which in, in, in my mind are pathways to PERMA, which we spoke about before. So I've identified six key psychological strategies which as a particularly as a clinical psychologist in my early days I taught people when the curve falls came when the trauma came and we used to teach people these six these six key psychological skills reactively to help them manage with the trauma that was happening or the stress and then they'd have those skills for life and for the last 10 15 years I guess I've been trying to take those out more proactively in schools and workplaces and equip people with these skills proactively rather than reactively. Um, so there's some fantastic strategies, I guess, key psychological strategies in there. One of them is um, MIGHT. So it's a 6M model, which includes mood, motivation, MIGHT, meaning mindfulness and mindset. MIGHT is like strength, as, it, as you were saying before. Uh, and there are various ways to think about strengths. The ones I think that perhaps you were referring to when it comes to a job might be what we call a performance strength. And there are some assessments out there that your audience might like to look to or contact us about that are more performance strengths that are specifically like work related. And they can be really helpful in this time, particularly if you're looking for a job. But the strengths that we focus on or what I focus on in the book are what we call character strengths. Mm. So these are morally valued strengths like love kindness, forgiveness, leadership, gratitude, and there's 24 of them. And in fact, when positive psychology was first launched back in 1998, Professor Martin Seligman and Professor Chris Peterson, one of the first activities they went about doing was looking across cultures, across religions, uh, philosophy through time, and they found that there were six common virtues and 24 common character strengths. And they created a taxonomy 
and they created an assessment. So right now, if I, you know, for people that might be listening and want to take a little break, as I said, morning tea, lunch or afternoon tea, you can actually log on and do this assessment for free. Uh, it's at the viainstitute.com and you can take a free assessment and it will simply rank order your 24 strengths from number one down to number 24. The first five are what we call signature strengths. And these are character strengths that, for example, if I didn't know what yours are, Matt, and I actually, I don't think I do know, if I know you fairly well, I've got a very good chance of guessing what they are because we know that they tend to be really visibly obvious. Like if you know some well, you can what we call strength spot really easily. So mm -hmm. I'd say absolutely you've got zest, you've got social intelligence, you've got persistence, you've got curiosity, you know, and, and perhaps I'm picking some of them up in your top 10. But um, right now, if you do that assessment, you can see, look at those top five and think about how you're using them already. But also think about how you might use them a little bit more creatively now that you're in a different situation from your everyday uh, life routine. But the other opportunity is to go to the bottom five. Now, these may not necessarily be weaknesses as such. They might just be what we call a lesser strength. So they're less developed. They may be a little less um, trait-like. Um, so they're not that generally natural to you. So if I give you an example, because I've seen thousands and thousands of these over the last 16 years or so, um, a lot of people actually have forgiveness in their bottom five. Mm. And um, I'm always really concerned about that, Matt, because there's so much scientific research to show that when you hang on to grudges, um, at past their use by date, for example, that that anger, that sense of you know irritation and frustration, and particularly if it moves towards rage, can literally make you sick. It, it affects it. Those negative emotions can affect your immune system and can literally make you sick. So there's a lot of research. Oh. So when you're learning to forgive, you're actually it's a gift to yourself because. You know, whether you decide you're going to let the other person know that you've forgiven them or not. I mean, ideally, hopefully you could. But if you couldn't, doing it for yourself is going to be a gift for yourself. And um, look, I just want to say, though, for some people that have been through significant transgressions that have had awful things done to them, that sort of forgiveness often requires psychological support to go through that. Not in every case, um, but I'm talking about, you know, just getting really irritated like a lot of my friends at the moment are irritated with people's behaviour. Like they just can't believe how sad it is to see how some people are behaving right now. And it is sad, but I guess I would say, you know, try and understand why people are behaving that way first and foremost, and then try and encourage them to behave in more positive and uplifting and helpful ways. Yeah, because you suffer when you try and control the uncontrollable, right? So you're trying Absolutely. to... Absolutely. So when people are trying... When people are bothered by other people's behaviour, that's indirect as well? Like it's not behaviour... We're not talking about behaviour that's directly at you, Susie. It's behaviour that people are taking more toilet paper than other people or like it's, a, it's an annoying behaviour on Instagram or Facebook and people get... <laughs> it sticks to them. It's... Yeah. They suffer. Why? Why would they do that? Yeah. And, and I think, look, firstly... They're probably normal human emotions when you observe that sort of selfish, self-centered type of behavior. But when you're in a crisis, it's within us to, for our survival, even if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, to survive that we, do, we tend to go to ourselves first. They, they have referred to it as the selfish gene, if you like. But yeah. in saying that, there's simultaneous research to show that we are such kind generous social human beings and when I see that behavior I feel initially sad that that's occurred but then I'm filled with hope and I'm more motivated to do the work that I do because I think we just need to um, perhaps normalize that for people that that might be your first response to think about what does this mean for me but as soon as you've got a bit of a plan let's try and move outwards and do as much as we can for everybody else mm. that would be my encouragement yeah I try and I try my best to, to, for me personally, when I see something that annoys me, uh, having like yourself, like you've, you've worked with so many different backgrounds now, it, it teaches you, pers like you, you're aware of perspective in life. Yeah. So whenever absolutely. I see someone doing something quite out there or selfish, 
I would, I'm trying and think and remind myself that there's something that that person, I wonder what that person's going through right now. That just yeah. stops me for a second. For, for me personally, it just stops me from ju- making a judgment, an unfair judgment. And if it's not directly hurting me, then I can quickly move past that. And if, if it's for the greater good, I, I did approach someone at the shopping center once and it's, uh, I was like, oh, do you mind if I, because I had all this toilet paper and <laughs> I've got kids and I'm like, hey man, could you, would you mind? It's like, oh yeah, sorry, mate. So it's, it's having, having initiative too, but not being a jerk about it. So you can, yeah. you can actually make the change in a certain way. Um, I know everyone's freaking out, but if you can empathize and you can, you, you can voice that empathy, like I'm feeling the same, yeah. thing, but can you please share? Sometimes you can. Exactly. Absolutely. And if I guess I, you hope that your friends around you or your family might call you on your behavior as well. You know, <laughs> you'd hope maybe I would, I would prefer someone call me on it rather than, you know, think later on, Oh, you know, that was really bad. I'd prefer someone to call me on it. I think. Mm. Yeah. What are the models like in your book? You mentioned motivation, but how do you yeah. actually get motivated when you're in such a, a low state or you're in an environment like this how does people what is the science of motivation for people who don't know rather than just seeing youtube videos and, and instagram influencers going oh motiv- be motivated like how do you just do yeah. that absolutely well there's like decades again of research um around a theory called self-determination theory in a nutshell it's a very complex big theory set of something has a lot of sub theories as well but we know that when you're really clear about your why and there's a lot of people that have spoken to that like Simon Sinek's um, work but it's basically anyone that talks about your why the underlying scientific research comes back to this self-determination theory that shows that when you're really clear on what's driving you and that's speaking to your values which um, I mentioned values before and if people have never done a value clarification exercise, I would highly encourage them to. It's part of, uh, in our book, under the motivation module as well. So if your sort of, your motivation is waning right now, um, I would come back to, well, why? Why am I actually getting out of bed every day right now? Why am I getting up, getting out of my pyjamas, you know, putting on something and sitting down, setting a schedule for my day? And it might come back to my family, actually. Even though I don't feel like this right now, like I'm doing this for my family or I'm doing this because I did have goals. And right now, yes, there's an obstacle, but I'm going to get, we will, this will pass and we will get through this into the future. So right now, um, I mean, for me, interestingly enough, my motivation seems to have gone to another level. So so I don't know what that is in me. And that's like, I guess, an individual difference. Some people might be, going in overdrive which i've actually got to really watch because you can burn yourself out if you do that but other people they will really have lost their motivation and they'll need reminders so you know getting sticky putting it up at your workplace visual images of you know what why you're actually doing this um and ideally if you can connect it to beyond yourself like Mm. you know for your family or for the community or for society because again we know that um, you know, that if there's something bigger, that that also helps affect motivation as well. But mm-hmm. the other thing that is obviously mindset. So being and being able to capture uh, the ants, I've been talking, I've done lots of media interviews in the last couple of weeks and the ants are coming up again and again. The automatic negative thoughts, which at their worst are irrational. So there is quite a lot of jumping to conclusions right now of what's going to happen Mm. rather than going, okay, this is all we know right now. That's Let's important. take a day to time and see what the information is tomorrow. Um, and there's also a lot of, I guess, underestimation of our capacity to cope, like thinking, I can't do this. You just really have to be mindful and mindfulness we cover. You need to be mindful of your mindset and the stories that you're telling yourself and whether they're helping or hindering right now. And I'm not saying get rid of them. Not like because the more you try and push uh, a negative thought or a negative emotion away, we know that they come back stronger. So it's more like inviting them in. Uh, Rumi, the famous poet, spoke about inviting in the uninvited guests. Let them take a seat on the bus, but they're not driving the bus. You're the one driving the bus. But rather than getting rid of them, invite them in, come back to your values and proceed in a values-congruent direction. 
Mm, that's really, that's really, really good. For me, one way to actually deal with negative thoughts is to share them in a very safe environment with trust yeah. people. And then that gives me perspective and I feel like I've actually digested it out. Like I've got it out of my head. Absolutely. That's such a good strategy, Matt. And I, I think I would also suggest we know historically men don't seek help, um, psychological help. They're, they find it difficult. That's changing, thankfully. Yeah. But what we do know is, like for me, I know with my female friends um, and also obviously as a psychologist, but if I've had a lot of these ants, I would you know, speak to my friend about it or and, and a few of my friends are psychologists, which I'm very fortunate and they would very quickly give me another perspective on that thinking. Now, if you're someone that's just ruminating inside your head, you're not talking to anybody else about it, you believe those thoughts to be facts. And yeah. thoughts, are not, n- thoughts are not necessarily facts. That's something really important to remember. Just because you have a thought, it's not a fact. And we've got to be able to be like detectives or scientists and be curious about it and decide, is there any evidence for it? How is it helping me to think like that? And perhaps, you know, what would I say to my best buddy if they had a thought like that? Because it's so easy to challenge other people's unhelpful mindsets, but it's really hard to do when it's in your head. It's one of the things that I, I would argue is within most our grasp is to, to be able to express it to somebody. If it's um, someone personally or professionally, there's something there's, I think it's someone in our lives that we can generally it's within our grasp to be able to communicate that out because when I share my thoughts to other people my feelings do get validated in a way because the people I share it to generally care about me they love it yeah uh, so they're not going to be like oh you they're, they're dumb that's dumb to think that or they might say that sometimes but um <laughs> like, they hear me and that's important to be heard and to be seen absolutely Matt and you picked up on a, a really important and classic counseling technique if you like um you really need to validate what the person said and how they've been feeling first before you go giving them a different perspective or giving you know providing them a solution you really need to reflect back what you've heard and how they're feeling so because people need that sense of validation before they're going to be open to hearing a different perspective so it might be gee matt i can I can sense and I can hear that it's really tough right now, you know, young family, you know, challenges with work or whatever they are. Um, But, you know, and I'm sensing that right now. Um, Would it be okay with you though? I've got, from where I'm sitting, I actually see some opportunities for you, like, or I see a different perspective on this. Would it be okay if I shared? So always ask permission. Don't go straight in and throw your perspective on someone because people are again to like their, barriers go up and they won't listen unless they really really respect you um but yeah I always listen listen and reflect back first we're running out of time Susie but I yeah I, I just want to I think we should do this again actually um we Love to. this because um I, for the examine life I want to get some um more regular guests on the show like um like yourself a good friend and and people really need like guys if you're listening right now like and watching we really need to turn to experts and i need a plug susie because not because she's asked me to but because <laughs> i actually generally am seeking i'm actually challenging where i get my sources from because my my yeah. mind is my strongest in my body but my mind is so important i need to keep this in check and i, need, I want to keep it in check with people who have done research and have uh, credible and right now the time is uh, i'm challenging all the influencers telling all that let's all find facts and share things that are from a reliable source and, and Dr. Susie's book is really important. How do we, how do people get it? Like with all this so can they get it shipped or e-version or what's the, the best yeah, way? Uh, we don't have an e-version yet. We have it, it's available on our website and then and while it's, you know, Australia Post is still running, we can ship it anywhere in the world. But um, I did hear this morning that apparently Amazon is closing down in Europe. I'm not sure. You can at this point purchase it through Amazon or Book Depository, um, but I'm not sure how much longer that's going to be available, but definitely through our website at this point. Yeah, so what's that website, Susie, so people know? It's thepositivityinstitute.com.au. And we have lots of other resources on there too, Matt, and people can email us. If we're happy to help in any way we can, even if that's connecting you in, um, you know, to other people, if we can't help. Mm-hmm. If you're lost right now, guys, particularly with 
you know, like um, what to do next with work or, you know, you want to look, revisit your strengths and your virtues. It's very, very important. Susie's worked with some of the best people and she's, she's our top expert in Australia with this. So I would, I, I just can't recommend enough if you're looking to pivot and you're looking to, to change things up and, and want some guidance, Susie's team or Susie herself would be able to help you. And her new book is fantastic. Like I got it, it was at the book launch, it was totally I'm just 100% for Susie and what she does. So we're going to get Susie back. I think it's going to really help. It's going to change your life if you get this book. But um, Susie, thanks a lot again for having us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And I want to say thank you for the wonderful work that you do. And I think the examined life, like it's often unfortunately not until something significant shakes us up for us to stop and think about this. So if there's, if there is a positive in this, perhaps it is the opportunity to pause and take stock about what really does matter in our lives and on this planet right now. So thank you for taking your messages out to the world as well. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate it.